we're going to talk about spring feeding and feeders and we're going to now transition to growing your hive to summer and we're also going to tell you some things that you're going to see in your hive that I want you to know about between now and the time that we come and visit you so the first thing is you're going to use your inner feeder for a period of time and then at some point we want you to switch to a top feeder I'm going to show you how to make that transition so the first thing is you're feeding one-to-one -one solution if you weren't here last time let me clean that up for you one-to-one -one solution means water and sugar in equal amounts one-to-one -one. it is said that in nature the plants provide sugar concentration in a one-to-one -one ratio equivalent to water and sugar it doesn't matter whether you weigh the sugar meaning five pounds of sugar five pounds of water or you measure it meaning you know volumetrically it doesn't matter you'll end up with the same thing so what I want you to do when you're going to feed your bees with the inner feeder this is the process for it you're going to have your sugar ready and everything else staged before you go into your hive light your smoker put your gear on do you need to light a smoker to feed the bees maybe not but if you're new yeah it's a good insurance policy lightly smoke the entrance like we showed you wait a 10 count for the smoke to disperse you'll hear Voo sometimes from the bees as they deal with the smoke remove the roof smoke the hole use your hive tool to pry up the inner cover and then you're gonna scoot the inner cover to expose the feeder but you're gonna leave it on the hive and cover the top bars you're not taking it off you're just sliding it over it looks like this that's all you need to do you don't want all the bees out and you don't want to disturb them and then you have access to the holes where you can pour your liquid in now if you had food in there what's going to be in the holes bees try not to drown them you know but sometimes you can't avoid it you're going to pour in and it's going to fill you'll get some bees wet they may drown in time we're going to tell you that there's a transition state where you're pulling the feeder out and moving it to the top box that's a good time to clean it out okay so you're just sliding the cover over you're not taking it off minimal interruption fill the feeder and slide the inner cover back and return the roof put the hive back in order easy peasy right I'll get to that how often but during the inspections by the way I have to clean something up somebody said something about an a-frame hive earlier who was that what was your question about that I didn't answer it yes yeah the question is with an a-frame hive what do you do it just means they're going to build it out faster this will be an accelerated schedule so when we give you the plan we're going to talk in ranges because bees are like children every one of them is different and you're just going to have to judge accordingly which is why we have you do inspections now I get this question for new folks if the world is lit up with flowers out there why do I need to feed and do I need to feed yes keep doing it that's the answer I don't even have to build the slide out keep doing it it is said that bees prefer nectar over sugar solution and they do and it's better for them however if it's right upstairs and we could get them to take it and build faster that's beneficial for us and it's in the vicinity they are going to take advantage of it they're opportunistic now sometimes they won't take the syrup and that's okay let them have whatever's in nature that's that's okay right but if they're going to take it give it to them now wait let me say one thing I should stop feeding because what's provided in nature is better there's an element of truth to that 
the nectar that the plants provide come with nutrients and minerals and all that other stuff. But the fact of the matter is sugar is sugar is sugar. And in this case, we need them to have sugar for carbohydrate to build wax and do the operation. So it's not so much the nutrition we're after, it's after the energy burn, because these guys are working, cows, are working full steam ahead to do what they're doing. And we're literally just providing as much food resource as possible. So in time, I would obviously prefer that they use nectar instead of sugar solution, but in the build out phase, we're gonna compromise. Sugar solution and nectar provides carbohydrates and they need significant carbohydrates to build the comb. There's one thing you should know about when they're building comb. They need it to be extremely hot. So not only is it for the energy for them to move around and do the thing, but when they're building wax, they keep that area very warm so that they can work with the wax, which means they're generating heat through muscle metabolism and they burn a lot of energy, and they need a lot of food to do that. What about pollen substitutes? This is one where I'm gonna go the other direction. I don't think it's necessary. If you watch your hive here in New Jersey, anybody watching internationally, my, your mileage may vary, we have more than enough. My black truck is yellow right now with all the pollen on it. So you don't need to feed. Now, there's a school of thought that says sometimes if you put the pollen right there, and again, it's right there, and they can take advantage of it and feed the brood. So nectar and sugar solution is carbohydrate, and pollen is steak and protein. It's their protein. They must have pollen to build bees. In this case, I believe that pollen substitutes, which are not pollen, and pollen supplements, which are pollen substitutes with a certain percentage of real pollen mixed in, are not as good as the real deal. So you can buy these things extremely inexpensively. If you are going to do it, just put it a deck of cards. Don't put a slab on top of it, and it has to be right where the brood is over top of the frames. We have hive beetles in New Jersey now, and the hive beetles love to lay their eggs in this stuff. So when you put it in, deck of cards, they'll eat it quickly, no hive beetle problems. If you put in a big slab and the hive beetles take that over, one, you're breeding hive beetles, and two, you're not getting it eaten because the hive beetles foul it and they won't take it down. You can do it, I'm not recommending it. Don't need to do it. We're going to switch at some junction from the inner feeder to the top feeder. This is what we recommend. That's right off the Man Lake website. A lot of people make them. I get mine from Man Lake. When the weather is consistently warmer, we want you to use this. I don't know when that is, because you know how New Jersey springs are, they're like this, okay? When the weather tomorrow or the next day or in the next couple days is not going to chill the liquid down to the point where the bees will not take it, that's the time to make your switch. That's your rule of thumb. If you're, if you're not getting to that consistency where it's 60 degrees at night and warm during the day and the liquid that you're putting on, they can't take it down in time that it sits overnight and gets too cold for them to take, then you should be using your inner feeder. This replaces your inner cover. You're going to put this right over top of your box, and then you're going to ask me, what do I do with my inner cover? You take off the outer cover. You put your feeder on, you fill it with liquid. Don't spill it all over the place, because you're going to incite robbing. You're going to make sure that you return the inner cover on top of it without a notch. This is really important. I don't know if this one has one. It does not. So we've talked about this where some of them come with a notch here that makes the top entrance. 
If you have the notch, it gives opportunity to get down into the feeder. We do not want anyone to have access to the food except from the bottom. So tape the notch off or make sure that it's closed. But, you know, I, I like to keep the inner feeder on top of, I'm sorry, the inner cover on top of the feeder because I don't want to take it back to the garage and have to bring it out later. Yeah? Can you just spin the top cover around and put the notch at the back? They'll still find it. If you have an opening, believe me, they'll find it and they'll get in. Yeah? Why not just put the inner cover under the feeder? I tried that last year and seemed to work pretty good. Yeah, the question is putting the putting the feeder over top of the inner cover. You could do that, but we want them to get as much as they can. And if you provide the barrier, they may, may not potentially take it all. So um, don't overfill this thing. It'll take gallons and gallons and gallons. You're gonna cause yourself a significant headache. And we don't wanna feed the bees at that rate. Just because you can doesn't mean you should. So let me talk about that. This is the reason why. <laughs> if you're putting a gallon and a half or two gallons over here and a gallon and a half or two, yeah, they could take it and man, they're gonna to go to town with it. But when you wanna do an inspection, you gotta take that off and you'll end up spilling it all over the place and getting it all over you. So just use a gallon. You could put it on both sides. That gives bees most access to it. And you wanna feed them at the rate that they're taking it down and it's empty when you come back. I have a question? Um, so I skipped the inner feed and went right to that one, right there normally. So I have the man like, and it went, the building waxed up into the, the screen area. Yep, hold on to that. <laughs> I have a picture of that. <laughs> this is one of my favorites, Arizona iced tea. It is the perfect container to feed with. These are my hives. By the way, there's the gateway hive that I just told you about. You can see that the gray is the brood box and the white is the feeder. Now, I did this so I knew which hives I fed. I kept the bottles and then I go and collect them. So get yourself some Arizona iced tea and mix your solution. It makes really convenient, sturdy something to carry them out. Just a little tip. It is possible to overfeed your bees. This is a very common new person mistake. They're so eager that they make this mistake and it will do you in. When it happens, the bees are gonna take the excess sugar because they love to hoard and they're gonna put it in where you don't want it. And they're gonna overwhelm the hive. The bad news for you is this is the time where you want the colony to build out and you're stunting the growth and you're potentially creating a swarming condition because the queen has no place to lay. So you want to inspect your hive as you're feeding it for overfeeding. So one of the other things you'll do in time is you're gonna look in your brood area where you see bees, I'll show you this in a second, and you wanna make sure that they're not putting nectar in there. If they are, you need to slow it down, okay? They will recover if you did this and you caught it quickly by cleaning that area out right away. This is what it looks like. You see the shininess. When they store nectar in a cell, it almost looks like a glass little pearl in it. This is a hive, as you can see, that has nectar stored right in the brood cell, which is not a good thing. To take this a little bit further, that's what it looks like. If you see this, where the bees have emerged, that's what all those holes mean. Now look. The queen starts laying in the middle and she works her way out. She goes here, 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 but eventually she spreads across this entire frame. And in time, the bees in the middle start to come out and you'll see holes. That's not a bad thing, that's normal. But when you see the bees immediately taking the hole where a bee emerged and putting nectar in it, that's a sign that something's not correct for you. You're overfeeding. Right? This is what it bad looks like. This is very bad. This beekeeper said, my hive swarmed, but I don't understand why. When I went over to see him, the queen only had that little spot and they just completely and utterly filled the entire brood frame with nectar. 
They were feeding gallons and gallons and gallons to them, overfeeding this hive, and the hive swarmed. Brand new colony. So this is the extreme of what you don't want to do. So I would look for what I showed you in the previous slide, something like this. This means stop feeding them for a while, let them clean this out. Yeah? Total new question. Um, how do you tell cap honey from cap screw? Does it look totally different? They look different. So the question is, what's the difference between capped honey and capped brood? You see it right there, I'm going to tell you. By the way, I have pictures of all this stuff coming up. So it's a good question. Anything that looks like the paper bag covering is capped brood. Anything that has that mottled appearance and it's covered with like gray brown wax is honey. That's honey in the corner and it's capped brood in the middle. Okay, and I have pictures of stuff coming up to even aid this further. I want to know if I'm sitting in your seat, how long am I going to feed? How long is this going to take? You're going to feed till we tell you to stop. <laughs> You're going to feed probably right through summer and into fall. Costco has a great sale. So does Walmart on sugar, by the way. You want at least two boxes fully built out and maybe even a medium if you can get there and have them build wax in the medium. That's going to take you all summer and maybe in the fall. So you're going to keep feeding all year. That's why we're switching to the bigger feeder. Ballpark finish date for two boxes is July-ish in New Jersey. As I always say with these things, they're like children, your mileage may vary. It's not hard and fast, and it depends on what happens out in the world. We could have a May that just rains every day and it's gonna set our colonies back. Don't know yet. I have heard prediction that it's supposed to be a very rainy spring. We have to talk about water. We know that they're gonna get fed we know that they have adequate, I'm sorry, they're going to get fed sugar solution. You got that covered. You know that they have adequate pollen. They must have water to run the operation. Must. Maybe you're fortunate and you have a water feature on your property, but how close is it to your hives? Ideally, it's nearby because the shorter the trip, the more efficient. They need water to build wax, to do uh, dilution of nectar and all, all kinds of operations. We recommend a bucket with holes and floaties and I'd say put it 30 yards from your hives. If you set it literally right next to your hives, maybe they will or maybe they won't find it. It looks something like this. This is a typical five gallon bucket and it has holes drilled in the side. When the water rain, when the water comes up, it gets to the point where the water goes out of the holes and it doesn't overflow and your floaties aren't laying in the grass. They must have floaties. In this case, they're using styrofoam peanuts because the bees have to land on it and walk down to the water. They don't like to get their feet wet. If you put them otherwise, they'll drown. So you have to have something for them to land on. Now, I've been asked about this thing that we all loathe called a Boardman feeder. That's what it looks like. It's a mayonnaise jar. This is something that if you buy a beekeeping kit or you look in the catalogs, you can feed your bees right at the entrance by inserting that plastic thing in. We do not recommend that. Do not use front entrance feeders. They draw predators, including other opportunistic bees, to the entrance of your hive. And then when they get a whiff of what's inside, you're under attack. However, good idea for giving water right at the entrance. Boy, you can't get any more convenient than right there. The other thing about these things is they're really super small quantity and they'll drink that thing down in a day or sooner. So you have to go out and fill it all the time. It's not a bad price to pay. You're probably gonna go out being new and check your hive all the time anyway. So if you have a Boardman feeder, don't put food in it, put water in it and use it that way. Is there a downside to having the bucket of water like six feet in front of the hives? 
Yeah, the question is if it's closer. Yeah. Yeah, if it's closer. Wait, wait one second. Let me see something. Thank you. This is your question. <laughs> the bees do, if you've looked, waggle dance. Waggle dance says there's an opportunity for something I want, and it's in that direction and this far. When something is close to them, they do the round dance. If it's too close that they can't do a round dance, meaning it's right next door, they can't communicate that, then they only find it by serendipity. This is what people say about this. If you've been to our mentoring hives, you know that we have our mentoring hives on a rail, and the water bucket literally sits where I'm standing, and the bees find it perfectly fine. The key to it is put the water out now, and put it hopefully where the bees are gonna find it. You can aid them in that by giving them some sense. You put a little drop of anise in the water. Sometimes people put bleach in the water. That sounds funny to us, but the bees smell that, and they go to the water. It's attractive to them. Ask me, they end up in my pool all the time. So what you don't want is bees at your water source, which is their pool or their fountain or their whatever it is. So put your water out now, like go home today and on your way, go to Lowe's or Home Depot or your favorite store and buy one of these buckets and get your water out this weekend. Got a couple bird baths, you know, before you eat from the, where the hives are. Yeah. Yeah, the question is birds and bees uh, together in harmony. <laughs> I, what, what, what I do, I have bird baths. Yeah. We have birds all over. I put rocks in my bird baths. Yeah. And the bees land on the rocks and the birds come and drink out of it too, so it's okay, they live fine. I didn't know if they were yeah. running. They'll be okay. What, what you want to run into sometimes is people have hummingbird feeders. And if you get that solution different than what they want, when you mix hummingbird solution, you should mix it to a certain percentage that attracts the hummingbirds, but the bees aren't interested in it. If you mix it close enough, the bees will come there. If your neighbors are saying, you got my bees are on my hummingbird, tell them to change the way the water is mixed and look up how to do it. Yeah, the question is if you have a natural resource like a creek, it's absolutely fine. You don't have to do anything. You still might want to do this anyway, but um, I have the same. Now, my creeks dry up in July, so I have two of them. Is there any reason why the birds wouldn't go near the bird path? Is there a reason? Will the birds avoid the bird path? Not that I'm aware of. Okay, that's what my neighbor claims. I've, I've not seen that. Okay. Yeah. Could you put water, that's a great question. Nobody's ever asked that, ever. Could you put water in one side of your man lake, Peter? I don't see why not, honestly. Good one. Okay, you have a new hive and it's not going according to plan. What could potentially happen and what do you do about it? If they're not building comb, or they're building drone comb, drone cells. If they build drone comb, if I look at a frame of comb, all my f cells are a certain size for workers, and then if it's supersized, it's for drone. It is normal in a colony for them to build drone, and they usually build it in the margins, and what I mean by that is around the outside and, I'm sorry, out of the outside edges of the frame and on the outside of the brood nest. If you're building drone comb right in the middle, Something's not right, so you need to call us. The answer to every one of these problems is you need to call us. If you have two hives, as our recommendation was, one of them is going to town and the other one's not building comb for some reason, you need to call us. Now this is what I would say to you. Don't burn up our phones. <laughs> when they grab bees out of hives and they put them in the package through a funnel, they might get a lot of young bees in this one and not a lot of young bees in that one. And you may have to raise young bees in order for them to build in one hive is gonna be slower than the other. I'm talking about in time, 
in a number of weeks, you're not seeing your hive build comb and the new bees are coming out and they're not doing it for some reason, then we probably need to chat. If you see them building emergency queen cells, this means a queen cup, which I'm going to show you, right in the face of the frame, there's something wrong with your queen and the bees have decided she's got to go. Give us a call. We'll show you that. This is unfortunately not uncommon sometimes with packages. Suppliers make thousands of queens and every once in a while some of them are going to be rejects. And in that case, most times the colony will successfully make their own queen. It's just going to put you behind. But you're on our watch list if this happens and we want to know about it. If you see the bees putting syrup in the brood area, not in the corners where I'm going to show you it belongs, no rainbow, but all over the brood area, that means something's wrong. They've got nothing to do, but the foragers are out and they're going, well, this place is any good, as good as any other place, and they're putting it through. Now, they will not put nectar commonly in the brood cells because they reserve that for the queen. But if the queen is running around in there and she's not mated, not doing anything, but they're building wax and they have a, they're put it right, right in the middle of everything. This is a problem sign. If they're lackadaisical, one of my favorite words on this world, they're just not doing anything, something's wrong. They should be as industrious as can be. And if you're not seeing that, there's, there's just something not right about what's going on. And this is why we want you to have two hives so you can compare one against the other and you'll know right away that one of them has got a challenge. And as we said, send an email if you're seeing these things. N W N J B A at live.com. N W N J B A at live.com. That's our email address for the mentors. Let's talk about the cadence of colony growth. What should we anticipate? I want you to get to eight frames built out and occupied in the first box. That's your milestone moment. Then you're going to add your second box and let the bees build everything out. What does it mean when I say to you, I want the box to be built out before you put the next box on? I'm going to tell you that because that can get confusing. The real question is, are the bees using the entire space? Well, the fact of the matter is, if I put the, if you go in today, even with foundation and no actual hive, bees are everywhere. You could say, well, that's built out. No, it's not. It's bees are everywhere. Doesn't mean they have an operational colony. An operational colony looks like that round thing that I showed you in the slide before. It has a brood nest in the middle with stored stuff on the outside and honey reserves on the, on the periphery. That's a, a ready to go box and I'm now ready to put on. So what I'm going to say to you is, even though they cover all the frames, I want you to do this. I want you to be able to pull two, or in this case, since we have a feeder in, three and nine, and they should be built out. And what I mean by built out is this, this is the test. There's comb on both sides and end. There are some form of resources being stored in that comb. It's not just empty comb. There's some nectar, there's some pollen, there's something in them stored. And there's lots of bees on it. Not onesie twosie, but you know, a third of the frame is covered. So they built, they built, they built, they built. They're almost to the full outside. I pulled those two frames and now I see that condition. I'm ready to add a box. Now I don't want them to get absolutely crammed against both sides. I don't want that. I want them to build the vast majority. We have a plan to get those final frames built. This is the way you do that. We want them to build out ideally from one to ten. If you don't have the feeder, this is what you would do. So one is not in a box, it has a feeder, you do this. 
I've, I've looked at my frame and I have ants. Uh, <laughs> I have um, those, those frames built out that I want. I'm not going to put my second box on with the feeder. I'm going to pull the feeder out. I'm going to take that frame that never got put in here and I'm going to put it back in. But what I'm not going to do is put it in position one. I'm going to take the frame on the outside and I'm going to move it over that's built out and I'm going to put that foundation frame in the middle. Everybody following me on that? Because I want it closer to the brood nest and if it's closer to the brood nest they're going to build the wax. If I leave it out in the netherland they may not ever build it. You're, you're going to take those out and you're going to put 10 frames in the box. Yeah, what, what you're saying to me is that your feeder takes up two frames instead of one. I, I might take one frame and put it in position two and one frame and put it in position eight in your case. I don't want to put it right in the middle of the brood nest, but I do want it in vicinity of the brood because I want them to build the wax, okay? But what I'm doing is I'm pulling my feeder out because I'm going to put it in my other box and I'm putting those empty frames in and I'm hoping that they're going to build those while they build the second box. So everybody's clear on that, right? I've pulled my feeder out. I didn't put it in the outside position. I put it somewhere in the middle. The goal here is if that frame with foundation is closer to the brood, they'll be more inclined to build it. They don't like empty, barren landscape in a food storage area when they have an active brood. So they'll build it out for you. And I've gone in new people's hives a year later and those two frames have nothing on them because they didn't do this slide into the inside. So don't miss this step. Place your second box on the hive. Put your feeder inside of it, your inner feeder. Now look, if you're in the point where you're in the weather, where you could put the top feeder on, you could take your inner feeder and put it in the garage. Put your 10 frames in that box and feed from the top. You'll have to make that decision when you get to this point in your journey. But if you are putting it in, you're going to fill it. Now look, if it's cold at night still, use the internal feeder. Okay. I told you that from now until the time that your box is built out, you're going to see things. I, I used this phrase last time, doggy, ducky, horsey. Some of these things are extremely basic, but bear with me. I want you to see these things and make sure that you've seen them at least once. That guy in the middle is a drone. If you've never seen a drone, it becomes absolutely evident that it's a drone by his eyeballs. Look how big his eyes are compared to the worker next to him. That is so he could spot the queen. If you also look at the size, he has a long barrel-like body and longer wings and he's pretty easy to spot. Now sometimes people confuse drones for queens. The distinctive sign is look at the drone, its wings are past the tip of its abdomen. On a queen, the abdomen sticks out and the, the wings end earlier. Okay, drone. Queen, that's what she looks like. This one happens to be painted green, which is I think this year's question. Yeah, um, color. One step back. Yeah. I'm going to give you a timeline that makes a forecast on that in a, in a few slides. So hold that question. But how long will it take? I, I'll show you. Um, this is what a queen looks like. There, right there is the wing thing that I just told you about. Okay. And I want you to note what I said earlier about all the bees surrounded. They're heading to her. That's the queen's court. When you're looking at a frame and everybody's going their way, but you see that one crowd where everybody's looking in, that's what it looks like. This is a baby bee. Isn't she cute? She's adorable. She's soft and downy. She's ivory color. She just emerged. I mean, she probably is minutes old. She isn't hardened off. The, the 
fur or, or the hair on her thorax isn't even up yet. That's what a baby bee looks like. And now that you're building new bees, when you do your inspection, you're gonna look and you're gonna see this little runty, eye. it's not anything wrong with that bee. She just started, welcome her to the world. This is drone brood, drone brood. It's kind of hard to distinguish, but do you see the bullet shape to it? It's conical. It sticks up above the flat surface. When you look at it, and I think I have more pictures of it, it's like, like bubble wrap. That's what it looks like. When you see that, you're looking at drone brood, not worker brood. I'll have more pictures, I think, of that. Is there a percentage of drone brood that looks as healthy versus It not differs. Healthy? The question is, is there a percentage? It differs by every queen. Some queens make phenomenal amount, and others make hardly any. So I can't answer that question with a defined answer. Somebody asked me about putting the feeder on, and they build wax under it. I think it was, this is very common. This feeder, for whatever reason, doesn't have a great sense of bee space, especially in the gap. And you're gonna end up taking the feeder off every once in a while and scraping the excess comb off. I have a picture for that. But I want you to know that this happens with this feeder. They, they're, this is the, the beginning of the future, which is they'll build all kinds of wax underneath those pans. So expect that. And by the way, they'll most likely build drone brood, which I'll show you. That thing is a queen cell. It is commonly referred to as like Mr. Peanut. It looks a lot like a peanut shell. This one happens to be on the bottom margin of a frame, but sometimes you'll find it as a supersedure cell, which means they're replacing the queen right smack dab in the middle of the brood, which is where they chose an egg larva and decided I'm gonna make a new queen. And you'll see one of those jutting out in your thing. If you see supersedure cells, as we said, you need to give us a ring. I missed the question. If we see one of those on our thing, we call you. You should let us know. Well, what's your, I mean, what's your overall? I mean, when I learned before, I was taught, like, if you see queen cups yeah. being built, to just, like, crush them, uh, as long as you know your queen is still in there, yeah. I don't know, like, should you? Yeah, let, let me take a minute and address that. Okay. It is very normal, although you probably won't see it in your new hives, to see a queen cup. A queen cup on the bottom margin where I showed you before where the queen escapes is a cell that faces down and it has a cup shape to it. It becomes what we call a queen cell when they start to build the protrusion that they encase a queen egg in it. Queen cups, fine. No problem. It's expected. It's a, it's a typical normal behavior. A queen cell means they're building a queen for you for some reason. And if you didn't intend for it to be there, especially in a new hive, it's a problem. Her question was, should you go around and kill queen cells if you have an active queen? Don't recommend that. And not to dissuade you, but that's typically a second year swarming uh, behavior. We're not at that stage, so I don't want to confuse everybody and answer that question. There is a way to handle queen cells, and when we get to that part, we'll, we'll talk about it. But on the side, I don't recommend killing, um, you know, squishing queen cells. Unless you're doing a De Marie or something like that, we, we won't do it. Because this is the, the short answer to your question. If you're not sure you have a queen, or even if you do have a queen, they're building a queen for some reason. And if they're building a queen, yeah, cups are normal. Cups are no problem. But if they're building a queen and you still have a queen, there must be something wrong with your queen. Or they're ready to swarm, which is a different thing. This is normal brood. Normal. Remember paper bag. 
flat, not bullet shaped. Now there's a hole in the middle of the brood. What does that mean? That's great. That's good stuff. Because the bees in the middle have emerged. Remember what we said is she lays usually from the center out. So you would expect that your brood, carpet or brood, will open from the center out. So this is good. Not a problem with this. Now, when it looks like this, eventually the big circle will open up and the queen will come right back. They'll prepare and clean all those cells out and she'll come and lay anew all the way through it. So you will see this and it's normal. It's good. Not a problem. Now, when you have your feeder or you have some circumstance where the comb is allowed to be built, you're going to get this, which is called burr comb. Underneath the feeder, when they build across the top of the frames, they most likely will put drones. You're going to have to take your feeder off and use your hive tool and scrape it. And yes, when you do it, you're going to have worms and larvae. You're just going to scrape them up. So I recommend you always bring a bag, Ziploc bag out with you in your kit. Don't throw this stuff on the ground or maybe you could throw it out in the woods if you live that way, but usually put it in a bag and don't put it down on the ground by your hives. So this is normal. You're gonna see this. You're gonna see wonky comb underneath. You're gonna see burr comb where they build across the top. Expect to see that this summer. This is pollen packed in all different colors. Very good. You like to see a diversity in colors. It's going to be a little bit shiny. It eventually becomes what is referred to or is automatically referred to as bee bread. It's a, got like a honey coating on it. It's going to be sunken down in the cell. It's not right up to the edge. And when you take your frame and you look at it in the sun and hold it down, you will see pollen, especially around the brood. And I'm about to show you a picture of that. But this is where the factory is, where they've just stored it across the entire comb. Where would you find this? On the outsides, but right close to the outside of the brood chamber, brood nest, because they want the pollen to feed the new bees that they're building. I had a question about what capped honey looks like. This is what it looks like. It starts out as a white wax. Sometimes the wax is thin, so you almost see what's underneath. And as the bees walk, it gets a mottled appearance. It can even get dark and dungy looking, but it's perfectly fine. This is capped honey. Did I say pollen? Honey. Especially in the top boxes, you'll see that. When the bees get so popular <laughs> that there's no place to go, they will sometimes come out and hang off of the front entrance of your hive, especially in the summertime when it's hot. They might be bearding, that's what this is referred to, it looks like a beard, or they might be all over the side of your box. It's okay. This is common. When they are trying to temperature control and there's too many bees generating heat, they send them out and they hang them off the front. If you see bearding, it's not a problem. This is what the front entrance looks like. Now, there's a number of things. There's one thing to point out here, but there's a number of things to see at the entrance. What's coming and going? How often are they coming and going? You will see bees bringing dead bees out, undertakers. They'll drag a dead bee out and then they'll pick it up and they'll fly away with it and drop it somewhere. They don't leave the dead bees in. You'll see scuffles at the entrance. That bee right there is a guard bee, not the one that's flying, but the one that's approaching. It's back on its haunches, its front legs are up, and it's going to inspect every bee that comes in. You're gonna see guards patrolling the entrance. This is normal. And you're gonna see them tussle. Sometimes they'll see a bee come in and they don't recognize it. They're gonna corral it. They might be fighting and fall off. It happens every day. Don't be concerned over that. But there are guards guarding the entrance.
This is an odd frame in the context of it has weird stuff going on. We want them to build in nice, pretty, beautiful patterns. Sometimes they decide to do it differently. They have regular worker brood on one side and they have all drone brood on the other side. Now if you look at the drone brood where all the bullets are, you could see how big the cells are visibly. So this is normal. You, you're going to see them, they build every comb the way you want them. Sometimes they build them the way they want them. This is the rainbow effect. This one's a little bit extreme, but it, but it illustrates a point. This is, a, this is something you should see. What you see is this is the way the bees arrange a brood nest frame. Now that you see this, you're going to see it all the time. They store honey reserves up in the corner. This one's pretty excessive, so they must have a great flow. They leave this ring here all the way around. What's in these cells is pollen. They want it right next to where they're feeding the bees. And then you'll see that rainbow that has where they build the brood. This is very common. When we talk about a honey dome sometimes that the queen does not go up past, this is the kind of thing that we're talking about. This is probably a frame smack dab in the center of the top box and they've stored the honey across the top. That's why it has excess. Queens generally don't pass across the honey dome, which is why if you put a honey super on top, they don't go north of the honey. So the queen won't go up and lay. So somebody asked me a question last time, why no queen excluder? Because the honey dome keeps them from going up. This is a great brood frame. And all I say to you is look for the rainbow. It's very evident now that you see it, right? That's what it looks like. Full, tight pattern. Everywhere you see a hole is probably where a bee has emerged. It's not spotted and crazy. This is what a good queen looks like. We're going to switch gears. I need you to do a couple things in preparation for what's to come. This is pretty simple. You need the hive top feeder that we've been talking about. We need you to buy the Varroa mite test kit. Easy check. It's a yellow cap. You have to have isopropyl alcohol to put in your feeder, or in your feeder, in your uh, tester. You need a large tote that you're going to knock the bees into. Something like this big, plastic, rubber made, perfect. You, of course, because we've been talking about it all morning, going to need sugar. You obviously need a smoker. We haven't used one of those yet, or maybe you did. And you need fuel. Um, we recommend you use pine needles. They're probably the best fuel out there. And you need some way to do your hive inspection method, meaning take your notes. I was asked before what the theoretical timeline is to build. This is the answer. And what I'm going to do is I'm just going to hand these out. I don't think there's one for everybody, but you can look at it and I'm going to go over it real quickly. We're there today. What I've done here is I've laid out the inspection intervals on two weeks. And I've changed it to be every Saturday, but it doesn't matter. If it's four days, five days, seven days, whatever's good for you and whatever the weather dictates. It's just rule of thumb, okay? But we don't think, well, I've had beekeepers who go in like every day. We don't want you to do that. We need you to leave the bees alone, let them do their thing. If you're disturbing them all the time, you're, you're setting them back, okay? So theoretically, this is a schedule. Now, somebody asked me the, the second box range. I think sometime in mid-May to probably the beginning of June in New Jersey is when you're going to end up putting your other box on. And I will tell you dis distinctly, and by the way, we'll have all this stuff posted to the uh, website under that resources guide. Um, 
If you live in Hampton, Lebanon Township, High Bridge, Northern part, Warren County, and you live where I am in the southernmost part of Hunterdon, our, our things vary. Our forage and our plants vary distinctly. That's why I can't tell you it's gonna be this date. It all is where you live. That's why you're doing a two week inspection just to see how fast you're going. What I wanna do collaboratively at some point is have people telling us what they're seeing. We're gonna create a space, I'll show you at the end. We're planning on doing mentor visits sometime in June. We're thinking that in the June timeframe, late June, early July, we're gonna to come to your place and you'll have two boxes built out and then we'll show you how to do mite testing and we'll check at the progress of your hive or hives. So this is the time frame. We think you're probably going to have two full boxes by mid-July. That's the answer to that question that was asked earlier. I started out with mostly drawn cones. Did I expect that mine might be a little accelerated? You're going to, so the question was if you start with drawn comb, let's say you, you had a hive and you put them, yeah, you're going to get to the point where they're going to build those two boxes out and you'll be putting honey supers on. You should be good to go. Now, I wanted to also give you a sensibility about the overview of the year. The top bar is what we just talked about. We're going to get to the summer management, summer dearth, varroa mite, trouble zone. But wait, I have to say something. If you bought your bees in a package, and especially if you got them from SNF, your bees were treated. That's why I have not said anything about mites now. Your package should have come cleanly and you don't need to treat them. Some people go through the, the thing of doing it, meaning test. I don't think you have to. If you're buying a nuke, my guess is they can't sell a nuke un unless they have a treatment regime going on and they should also be treated. In fact, if you buy a nuke, I've seen purchases where they have an Apovar strip in them. Ask them about that. Is it old or is it current? And take it out if it's old. Get it out of there. You don't want to keep it in. Had a question in the back? Yeah, the question is about hive beetles. Hive beetles aren't a concern in New Jersey. We see hive beetles, maybe a dozen or so, and we get all excited. The people down south who have real hive beetle problems laugh at us about that. If you're so concerned about hive beetles in your hive, you can buy hive beetle traps or use Swiffer. You can go on the internet, but we generally don't have to worry about it. There, there is a concern actually coming to the forefront that if you're smashing hive beetles instead of trapping them, they possibly have viruses and they're spreading viruses in your hive. So do the trap method. So we don't have to check for mites if we got it. You should not have to check for mites. Stan's Hive came from Gardner, and if you go on our YouTube channel, there's a um, video of, I think his name is Mike, Gardner, talking about how he treats his packages, and you can find out that way. I don't remember the answer, but Mike talks about how he treats his package prior to, to Stan picking them up. Yeah. If you had If you had a dead out that was, did not survive and you're asking do you need to treat for, for mites, if the hive sat for any period of time in a dead state, the mites died. They need the bees to survive so you have no mite problem in there. Okay. I should add two things. I was asked earlier about packages and also dead outs. There's two new guides going to be on the website by this weekend. One of them is what do I do with the dead out? It's a complete explanation of how to go through them and do an autopsy if you want, how to prep them and clean them up and put them into service. Or how to store them if you have comb and you're not going to use it. That'll be a guide like the install guide. And there's also a guide that's going to be how to install, again, a nuke. How to get it out of the box, how to transport, like I said earlier. Building bees for winter. 
We'll go into the fall goldenrod, have your hives at 60 pounds, make sure you're mite free going in, make sure that you have good healthy bees while they're building their winter bees, and then we'll tell you in the end how to close your bees down and get you to Thanksgiving, or maybe even December 15th, depending on how warm it is in New Jersey, you never know. But we'll get you to that first frost where everything buttons up. So this is what the program will do for you in time. Right now we're in the, the end of the first one and heading to the second one. Last topic I think here and then we'll send you home. There's a lot of ways to keep records, I don't care, just keep records. Whatever works for you has to be reasonable, don't overdo it. Because if you burden yourself with record keeping, then you're not going to keep up with your records. So these are the things you have to do. What date, what was the temperature conditions when I went in, what did I see, why was I going in, what was my objective, and any other notes and things like that. I'm going to hand these out, um, ask you to pass them around. I have a form that I designed over years. I want you to know when you look at this form, use the front. There is no reason when you see it to use the back. I will explain that in a second. Some use a book, some use forms like this. Some people even take recorders out and record the whole session of them talking and then go back and transcribe it later. Whatever rocks your boat, I don't care. Just as long as you take records. Don't complicate things, you're not gonna do it. This is what I would recommend. I'm coming out to, ins to inspect this hive. Before I put my suit on, before I light the smoker, I stand in front of the hive and I observe what's going on and I take my basic notes. Temp, time, activity, anything I observe. Then I light my smoker, I put my gear on, I go in, I do my inspection, and as soon as I'm done putting the roof back on, I get a frosty beverage and I write my notes. The reason is, don't go through two hives, three hives, whatever you have, go in and tomorrow afternoon try and write your notes, you're gonna do a terrible job. You must do it when you finish. Build it into your schedule, okay? If you wait, it all runs together. Especially, look, the first time you're going to remember it like no tomorrow. But after the 20th inspection, you'll wonder whether you're talking about this week or last week. I would also suggest to you that you do keep your records for each hive and keep them in a book, but keep a single to-do list of things that you have. I need to bring the feeder in. I need to clean up this comb. I need to do whatever it is. In time, you're going to have that. Money where my mouth is. This is what I have. I have this, and inside of it, I have my sheets. And if, and if you look, I label them, and then I take them after I'm done, out in the yard, and I put them in here, and I have numbers for each one of my hives, and I literally file them, and have records from the day that I created my hive, okay? But I maintain a separate to-do list and I check them off. And every time I go out, I check my to-do list before I go out of the yard. Now there's one other thing that I do sometimes. I gotta find the form. This is a handmade list of what I want. And I go hive by hive and say, I'm gonna do this and my objectives because sometimes when I get out, I have a lot of hives. I, I can't remember what I, what I was I doing here or what did the to-do list say? So sometimes before you go out, you make yourself a plan. And I always say this, plan the work, then work the plan. There's a really important reason to do that. I'll come back to that in a second. Before you go out, make the list of things that you wanna do and walk yourself through, I'm gonna go out, I'm gonna do this, I'm gonna do da, 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 whatever. And it makes you, forces you, think about what you need. 
before you go out. When you have the bees open, it's not a time to discover that you forgot something and I gotta go back to the garage or to the house. It's detrimental to the bees to keep them open. State your business and get off the phone. That's what my father always used to say to me when I was a kid. State your business in the hive and get out, right? So if you find yourself, listen to me, if you find yourself keep having to go back to the house while you're doing your inspections over time, you're doing something wrong. Stop that. Fix that problem. That's a really important message. I want to go back to this guy. I get sick of writing notes by hand. Some people use like journals. If you look at this, I have to write the hive name, the date, the inspection form, time of day, temp, yard ID, and whatever. All of those things I could do comfortably sitting at the entrance. The rest of them are check boxes. I don't have to write lots of it. I just check the box that says there's lots of bees coming. I like to keep track at this point, that point, of what the hive configuration is. Does it have two deeps? Does it have three deeps? Does it have... I, when you study the form, you'll understand how it works. The back of the form is about full inventory of a hive. I'm not going to explain that. I like to do that every once in a while just to track the history of a hive makeup from start to finish, so I built a more comprehensive form. Only use the front. Never use the back. If you want to use the back, you let me know. And I'll tell you what it means. Note that it indicates the objective. So the top is about recording everything you see. The middle states what you were there for, and the bottom is what you did. And then you have a notes section and what I need to do next at the bottom. It doesn't show on the slide, but it's all there. We went through this. Okay, mentor visits. June time frame. We want to see two boxes in operation. We're going to come out while there's still some nectar flow left. We're not waiting until July when the nectar flow ends. We want to get out earlier than that. We're going to come to your help. We're going to plan different routes around the county and drive from place to place. We're going to do a bee inspection in your yard with your hives and your equipment so you'll have to light the smoker for us. We'll schedule one or two weekends to do this. We're going to come out with a team of a mentor, um, a secondary person, and maybe some others. And while we're there, we're going to do a mite check on your hive, and we're going to teach you how to do mite monitoring. Here's the key. When we leave, the next time, you're going to do the monitoring and report back to us. It's a requirement. So we're going to show you how to monitor, so learn, listen now, because you're going to have to do it the following time. And we'll determine whether you need to do treatments or not and what to do about that. Last thing I want to talk about is this thing. I know you all would love probably to just stay in touch and share your experiences. We agree. We used in the past Yahoo groups. It's really old fashioned, it's clunky, not very used. We're looking at different opportunities. I see some young folks in the room and some savvy IT folks, and some of you are probably better at computers than I am. Slack, WhatsApp, even Facebook, they all have collaborative community things. This is Microsoft Teams, very easy to use, free to use. We're looking at it possibly setting up a community place for us to work with. And you could go in there and go, hey, I did an inspection of my hive today and this is what I found. And you all could watch vicariously what each of us are doing and you could post questions. Email sucks. We keep giving you the email address anticipating that at some point we're going to go into a system like this. We're, we're looking at this, we'll probably give you instructions to come to this or something else. So that'll be something we're doing. The good news about this is as it says on the bottom, if you could use a text message, hopefully everybody can, you could use this thing. It's like instant messenger. I'm done. <laughs> Questions? What did I miss? 
when you do scrape the burr coat off the bottom of that thing, the drone brood is squirming around. That's an opportunity to look for mites right there. Isn't yeah, it? yeah. Yeah, the question is, and, and it's a good observation, Varroa mite like to live in with the bees that are being created, and especially the drone. So if you're scraping off burr comb and it has all kinds of drone in it, crack open the cells, look at them, and see if you can see Varroa mite on them. It can be an indicator. Looking at drones and whether or not they have lots of Varroa mite is not the greatest way. Uh, mite washes, but it, it's not a bad way to know whether you're in trouble or not. We do it all the time. So it's a good point. Yeah. The question is, when you mix your sugar syrup, how long does it keep and how should you do it? The simplest way is in a big pot, warm water, equal amount sugar water, mix it till it's clear, and then store it in your jar. You could put a little um, preservative in it. Uh, some people use bleach. T tell me what. Bleach vinegar. Just a cup. like. You know, look, this is what they say. When you want to clean water, they tell you like a teaspoon for a gallon, that type of thing. Same percentage to make it drinkable, and that will keep it from doing it. Uh, people put essential oils and other things in it. Just a little bleach probably will keep it from molding. If it molds, the bees will take it still. Um, this is why you mix it in small batches and feed it to them so they use it. If you leave it in your, you know, breezeway or whatever in your garage and it sits in the sun and molds, you're probably going to end up pouring it out. Yeah, Bob? So you can store it in your refrigerator. It'll keep a little longer. Okay, but you'll smell it if it begins to ferment and be able to smell Yeah, that's the key. You know, what Bob said was store it in your fridge like you would anything that, that you would drink, right? If you bought iced tea and then just give it a smell test. And if it's fermented, go pour it out do something else. Yeah. So what about, I thought there was a way to feed the bees in a jar of high fructose corn syrup with little tiny holes in the, in the cap? Yeah. yeah, the question is using high fructose corn syrup and methods of delivery. When you buy a package, as an example, it comes with a can with little holes punched in it. There's so many different ways to feed. You could feed with a top feeder, meaning a, a jar in a, with a box. Up. We want you to stay with it. The other thing about high fructose corn syrup is it's a perfectly fine food, but if you don't store it properly and it overheats, it turns into a HMF chemical reaction and it becomes bad for the bees. Um, so just stay with sugar water and keep it simple. Yeah, other questions? Yeah, the question is what happens when you get a bee in your suit and especially in your veil, which could be very disconcerting. The first thing is take a deep breath. Um, if you get really nervous, the bee is going to come after you. Ideally, if it's on your face, you want to get out of the bee yard as quickly as possible. I, I want to say this and I'm going to look stupid on camera doing it. Just robotically walk like this as quickly as possible, get away from the bee yard and pull your veil up and go for that bee and get it off your face. Um, you know, be, be robotic. Don't, don't be flailing and doing whatever and don't be banging on your, because if you do, you're going to agitate them and they're going to sting you. Now, you could tell a lot of times by that vibration, you aren't going to make it over there. You're going to get it and that's just the way it goes. The key thing is, look, just be calm, be methodical. Now, I've seen people who had uh, stuff in there. Look, some of us guys don't like them when they come in pants. And I've had them come in and get up to my knee. And when they get to my knee, I just reach down and I pinch it, right? So, you know, pinch to be underneath the suit. But when you have a veil on, you can't get to it. Walk calmly away, but then I know there's a super eagerness to get that thing out of you but chances are it isn't going to sting you right away. What's more important is that you take the veil off carefully and don't aggravate it. 
because if you smash it or push it or do something to it, it is more likely to sting you. So just take your veil up, move it if the bee is here, move it away from it, make space, get it off, and then when you get to it, flick it. Don't try to pinch it, grab it, smash it, just flick it away. And then it's going to fly away, walk away from the spot, and pull your veil back down and button yourself up. Prevention is probably the best answer. There should be no reason in a suit for a bee to get in, but it happens. That's how you handle it. It wouldn't get out of my veil. Like I got the whole thing off and it was inside my veil and I'm like trying to get it out and I just ended up killing it because I was like... Yeah, you pinch it. Um, if it won't get out of your veil, just walk away, leave the veil, sit, go get an iced tea and come back. It'll be gone by the time you get back. But if it's in the veil and it's not on you, that's okay. <laughs> Yeah, in the back I had another question. I missed the, uh, the top feeder. So we have two deep boxes. You put the top feeder on, then you're in the cover on top of that, and then the, the lid. Yeah. The, this is the key. The question is when you have your top feeder on, Man Lake, and you put the inner cover over it just to keep storage, right, instead of having to take it back. One, close the notch off. And two, make sure you, you have the roof down hard on it so that there's no gap. If you have the thing sitting even just like this where one bee could pass in, you're gonna come back into your hive and you'll look in your feeder and there'll be hundreds of bees dead in there. They're just, they're gonna get in absolutely any crack, right? If you're not comfortable with being able to seal that off by using the roof, just get rid of the inner cover, take it in and put the roof down hard over it. Um, you're okay with with an inner cover I'm sorry let, let me do that differently with a feeder on top you're not going to be able to ventilate the hive you, it's going to be closed off but the point is is that the bees should be able to access the food from the bottom but nothing should be able to get in and drown in the sugar it's really a mess to try and clean that out now when they have those feeders Sometimes what will happen is they can't get to all the sugar and it'll dry out and you'll get crusty sugar in there. Just take your hive tool, scrape it up, put it in your plastic bag and pour it in. It's very normal to see dried scaly sugar on the bottom where, where the uh, bees couldn't get to it. Yeah. Speaking of sealing, so they have the frame, the hive I haven't put it all together yet, but it's cedar, like protect yeah. Yeah, eco, there's a number of options. Obviously, the question is how do you seal a cedar hive? And, a, and I would assume you want to keep it natural. Yeah. You don't want to paint it. There's a number of options. Uh, eco wood is one. Eco wood you could get at Home Depot, but you have to order it and they'll ship it. Another thing, you could put a poly on it. I have a cedar hive. I did eco wood. It weathered really quickly for me, so I took it back in and put a poly on it. Poly meaning like a urethane. Uh, the other thing that you could do is use linseed oil, a natural oil to protect it. There's a number of options. Yeah. You'd have to do that quite frequently. That's why I switched to poly instead of linseed. Floaties, yeah. Yeah, the question is when you have a, a bucket, yeah, when you have a bucket and you have the floaties, what's the substrate? You obviously can't use the degradable because it'll melt. Uh, some people don't particularly like the idea of styrofoam, but the fact of the matter is we use styrofoam because it recycles it. But people use corks, they use the little uh, black balls that they use sometimes in ponds. There, there's tons of different options. The whole key is it can't be water soluble to the point where it sinks. Now, you can fill the bucket up with rock and do it that way. That also keeps it from falling over and as long as the bees can get to the water. Yeah, you know, the other thing that you'll have with this and you just have to live with it is, I have raccoons and they come and find things and they wash it in the water and they knock my bucket over. So. Sometimes you have to find other options. So my your second question. My second question was, um, it sounds like you're recommending that the second box we put on be another deep, but is it okay to go to a medium on the second box if we're like, in, just in terms of like being able to handle it better? 
Yeah, the, the question is, could you switch from a deep to a medium? I, I would say yes. The conventional wisdom is you need two boxes to overwinter in New Jersey. So that means if you're doing a deep and then you decide you want to put a medium on, my guess is you've got another medium coming in your future to have the volume to be the same. But yes, that, that's okay. I don't see any reason why not. Yeah, let me go over here real quick. So you mentioned a couple times going over feed. Yeah. Can you overfeed using an inside feeder? Can you overfeed using an inner feeder? Usually that only holds a gallon and um, yeah, I, I've not seen people run into problems with that, but I guess, yes. If you're crazy, you can keep the thing topped off and... So keep it like half full? And I, I would do a gallon at a time inside. Yeah. yeah. Probably have two a gallon at a time inside. You, you have, wait, let me make clear. You don't have one feeder that's two gallon, you have two separate feeders. And two hives, one two gallon feeder each. Okay, yeah, gallon and a gallon. In, you have a two gallon and a two gallon. Put one gallon in this one and one gallon in that one. Every, on the two week inspections? On the two week inspections. So like we and you may open your hive. Look, first week, first week, then two weeks, two weeks, two weeks, two weeks until the end of summer. You may open your hive in two weeks and find that there's still food in the feeder. It's probably likely. Or you may get to the point, again, the nectar flow is on right now, so they may not take it. Or you may get in and you could literally go in every day and it will be empty. So just look and see what you have. But I would not overload them with liquid. Yeah. I'll come um, to you in a sec. I have honey from last year, uh, a full super full of honey. And I'm still unclear on whether, like, if I should use that or not. And I guess I'm wondering if I do use it, would I be able to harvest honey this year? Or would it, I'm not clear on what the benefits are if I should use it. I really kind of just want to extract it and eat it, but if I'm going to get honey later in the year, I'd rather just use it. Yeah, so uh, the question is, what do you do with honey left over from a hive that didn't make it last year? You can do all of the above of what you suggested. You can take it and, and consume it. You can feed it back to the bees. The way you would feed it is you would put it in the hive, and if they don't want to eat it, you could scratch the surface of it just to break so they could taste it and then they'll take it down or you could store it and feed it to them later when you have a hive that is brand new starts from scratch and doesn't have comb you should not anticipate that you're going to get honey if you have a hive that is built out which it sounds like you do and you put bees in it it all depends on how fast the population comes and what the world looks like this year you may get honey and then you know you'll have honey for the season. I can't tell you which it's going to be. So, uh, go ahead, Bob. So it also depends, is it real honey or is it sugar water honey? It's cats. cats. And if you continue to, to feed all through the nectar flow, then you have sugar water in that honey and it's not honey. And then it would just feed it back to the bees. If you can be sure that it's honey, then you could harvest it and eat it if you'd like. I'm you confused by what you mean. So I yeah, I'll, I'll take that. Year. And it's cats, so, and you're saying, can you just say what you said again? Yeah, his, his point was, I, I want to say it because I'm on the mic. Um, it, it's a valid point to think about that honey that you're talking about. Where did it come from? If you had a beekeeper who fed their bees quite earnestly at the end of last year, then the honey that's stored is converted sugar water, which is not honey. It's sugar solution honey. It's not from nectar from plants. Now you're in the spring and you decide you want to harvest that and you think you're going to put it in the jar when it's actually just sugar water that you're harvesting. So you know whether you fed the bees and whether that honey is floral source or beekeeper source. If it's beekeeper source, feed it back to the bees. Don't harvest it. What do you mean? Meaning you fed the, the hive and that's what's capped. Because you, know, you saw the honey frames that we saw the, the capped honey can be honey that you fed. That's what they do. They'll cap that off. And you're looking at sugar water honey. You're not looking at floral source honey. So did you feed your bees last year? Not in the summer, only in the spring. Not in the summer. So if you didn't feed them in the summer 
and you believe that frame was built out in the fall, then chances are it's goldenrod honey or aster or something, and you could probably harvest it. But if you went into August, September, and you fed your bees in the dearth, and they filled up your box to 60 pounds, it could very well be sugar solution honey, and then you're not going to want that. Yeah. yeah. For your smoker. Um, the question is what fuel can you use for your smoker? I, I went out, I don't know if this is a possibility, I went out to shoot that video the other day and didn't bring enough fuel with me. So I walked out in the field and I took corn husks laying there and I used that. Find something like that. Uh, you could use cardboard. When, when I was in Italy, the guy took a sheet of cardboard and he rolled it up into a big ball and he lit the end of it with a torch and he put it in his smoker and I'm like, what are you doing with that? He used cardboard to smoke. Do, do you, this is what I would say, somewhere between when you leave here today and when you get home, you're going to see a pine tree with needles and it's going to be wet because it rained. And if you set it out in the sun in an hour, it would be dry enough probably to light. What you want to do is start with a piece of newspaper in the bottom and put that in. And as the newspaper is burning, it'll dry any of the moisture out of that pine needle. And then if you put wet on top of it, as long as that fire is burning in the bottom, you should be able to dry that out enough for you to use it. Yeah? If you're using eights versus tens, do you need more than two boxes to get in a shower? The question is, if you're doing eight frame high versus a full 10 frame, do you need to do more boxes up on the top? No. Uh, eight frame high, too deep, is sufficient to get through winter here in New Jersey. It's a reasonable equivalent. It's not as good, quote unquote, but um, from the population of bees and food stores, but it's more than adequate to overwinter in New Jersey.